Well, welcome everyone. I'm here with Di Dixon, who is the head of the Health and Knowledge Precinct at Griffith University and an incredible collaborator. Uh, Di and I have uh, known each other for quite a while and I've just asked her for a few minutes of her valuable time just to ask a few questions for all of our benefits. So, Di, welcome. Thank you. I would love for you to share a little bit about your personal experience of coaching, how, how you ended up on a coaching program. Um, well, it was predominantly through meeting with yourself at a thought leaders event um, several years ago now um, and it was probably at a point in my career where I was transitioning with my own management style and the management style of those um, above me um, and there have been a lot of changes so that whole change management prompted um, me to be open to getting more external advice about some tricks of the trade and better how, how to read people more um, effectively maybe and, and manage a lot of conflict and potential conflict that could be occurring in the, as I saw my career progressing. Yeah. So how do you like to coach really when you think about it? What's the ideal? So for me is to have someone that you can be very honest with yeah. so that you can really lay your cards on the table and not make it into a therapy session but <laughs> have that element to it where you can be completely truthful but look at real case scenarios of things that have happened and reflect on that yeah. and how I could have dealt with it better and having someone who's not connected to my immediate environment it's very useful to then reality check it and put it back into perspective and then also look to how it can improve and um, react in certain circumstances going forward. Yeah, so for you it's always been a real face-to-face -face cup of green tea. Mm -hmm. We did have that chai tea once. <laughs> we, were <crazy. laughs> we were crazy. But for you, what is it about connecting face-to-face -face that you feel helps? So for me, my leadership role and my management role is very much about personal relationships and making a connection with people to gain as much as I can from them in terms of collaboration going forward but also their trust so they can empower me to act on their behalf so I just really translate that into my coaching and mentoring environment that I find I gain a lot from having a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, and just feeling connection with, with the person who I'm seeking advice from. Mm. So what is your challenge? What's the toughest <laughs> challenge right now that you're dealing with with collaboration? So for me, um, managing a, an innovation precinct that has a whole wealth of stakeholders who have very different and often competing priorities, but do have a shared vision, it's keeping them on that track of shared vision um, and what we're trying to deliver. Um, and a lot of the challenges that naturally fall out of that are people's um, behaviours around knowing what to share and when to share it and to be true collaborators in terms of their cooperation with me and also trusting me that they can share something that I will then act upon in a way that's going to benefit them as well as the broader precinct. So it is a challenge with, um, in the majority, I, I think my, my leadership and management style does allow me to have very positive relationships and in my current role I'm empowered by both Griffith University um, and Gold Coast Health to act on their behalf within the precinct so that does put me in a, power, a position of influence but equally that also means that I have to make sure I bring everyone along with me on that party um, and sometimes because of the amount of stakeholders it can be quite um, challenging to make sure that I don't miss something along the way so a lot of my collaboration issues do stem back to making sure I stay accountable to many um, but also stay true to what I'm aiming for on behalf of those that are empowering me um, along the way. Wow it's huge isn't it? So you mm -hmm. mentioned the word trust. Mm -hmm. Talk to us how important is trust when you're collaborating? I think particularly over the last four years of my journey in the precinct where my network of stakeholder management and my need to communicate at all levels of government, of agencies um, across the world to do pitches to investors, um, that it really is around building that relationship so that people will, will empower you to do what they need you to do. Um, when you're talking to investors, which has been my more recent journey, particularly with different cultures like the Chinese culture, that's completely built on trust. So from pitching an initial idea to one of the largest pharma companies in China, um, for them, they then see me as that point of consistency. So trust cannot be um, underestimated in those sort of negotiations, which um, has only been a recent part of my journey. And without that strong relationship, 
we we may not get to the to the end goal, which is to actually build an amazing research infrastructure um, piece within the precinct that will drive innovation and research for, for the region, not just the precinct itself. So. Um, but that also goes down to a one-on-one -on -one relationship with my key stakeholders, with other levels of government, that if people don't trust you or you don't trust them, then there's an automatic blockage with them being able to collaborate. Mm -hmm. So um, quite often in this role, as I've mentioned before, you have to take the step back and really see what could be challenging someone to trust you. Um, I'm a very open, honest person, and I believe that's why I can gain a lot of um, trust from people. So when I hit a blockage where someone doesn't trust me, or I feel they don't trust, um, or that I don't trust them, that it's become very obvious very quickly that we've become dysfunctional, and there's been a variation from that direction of what we've been trying to achieve as a vision. So as a leader, <clears throat> and I know that a lot of clients challenged with this situation. They bring on a team and then they're moving up in their leadership position and their influence. You have to trust your immediate team to get your back mm -hmm. as well. So when you're recruiting somebody, how do you know you can trust them as quickly as possible? Like <laughs> what is your secret that you go, yep, this person will be loyal to me. Is there anything that stands out that you would advise others to say, you know, this next year of collaboration, I really want to build a trusted team. Is there mm -hmm. one bit of advice that you could give to say, if you want to collaborate with people, what's, what's the first step that you take? I think trust your intuition. Yes. That, that immediate feel you get from somebody. I know that the team I have around me now are people that I've either connected with over a period of time with working with them previously or people that I've connected with on a personal level. Um, obviously, you want someone a bit more substance there and you don't necessarily want to create a team of, um, of clones and everyone thinking the same way. So for me, it's being intuitive to be drawn to particular people, not just because you you get that connection but because you can see things in them that you may self may not have so that you yeah. can learn from them as well as them learning from you because I do believe that whole team environment is about you all going on a journey together. That's great and when you think about leadership in terms of character so we've got trust but I think that you know the character of the people that come around us what would you say is the number one character trait you've had to develop as a leader? I think it's probably confidence in that um, credibility that people will take me seriously and sometimes I think in the early stages particularly of this um, transition in my career it's been almost like that imposter syndrome oh. that, that maybe you feel like you've been elevated to a position and you're taking everyone on this journey and suddenly you stop and go oh everyone's following me yes. I hope I'm going the right way but you have to have conviction in that because you've taken yeah. it to that part and people have got on the train with you so I think it is around that that long t sticking to the long-term vision and gain confidence as you go uh, and everyone has moments of, um, of uh, indecision or a lack of confidence in themselves I think and we all have those moments um, where you just have to take a moment to contemplate why you're doing what you're doing and as long as you know and you have integrity in what you're doing and why then people see that without you having to necessarily yeah. articulate it and I think that's where I've grown in this leadership role and, and the ability to get people to collaborate because they, they've seen the evidence of me staying true to my convictions and having integrity around how I do it and why. I love it, integrity. What happens if someone says they're going to do something and they don't? How does that make you feel? Oh, honestly, <laughs> how does this make you feel? Because I know as a female with integrity as my highest character trait and working across lots of different leadership fields, this is a question we're constantly challenging our leaders. What do you feel first when someone lacks integrity and then what action steps can you take to help people to grow in their integrity? So I think automatically it's an immediate frustration because you know that's impacted on something you've been expecting them to undertake or, or a way you've expected them to behave. Um, and then it's probably you go through a disappointment phase in terms of reflecting. Um, and then I suppose uh, it's really about understanding why and whether that's my perception of them not having integrity or whether I've missed something. So that ability to go back to communication and actually 
talk to someone about that and why that's happened and it could then be not a lack of integrity but another reason yeah. um, particularly when you're working with government agencies uh, and different levels of government there's a lot of politics there's a lot of behind the scenes things that um, I know my current stakeholders have to manage in the background and some of the times I might not be aware of that so yeah. I may think they've not performed but there may be a really strong reason why they've done something differently so I think it's making sure you don't overreact initially and actually give to have that conversation openly about why something's happened or and if there is a lack of integrity or a reason why someone's just not done what they should have done then it's trying to improve that going forward or find what the fundamental reason was for that. So you have to be pretty open-minded right? Yeah, like to be a yes. leader you have to be uh, open-minded? Very much so and, they are, and I think that's probably my journey over the last four years has been understanding that that you don't just get called a leader and become a leader and you don't just flick a switch it's huh. it's something that you grow into over time and you'll never be a final leader it's an ongoing journey you just learn different ways of dealing with things and experience is everything that's good isn't it is there something in the week you think this is my my one thing that will help me become more successful if I do this one thing each week that you can anchor down or ground, you know, I know from, from my experience I started to realise if I can just tell the truth, mm -hmm. you know, if every week I'm going to express my feelings in a truthful way mm -hmm. so that I don't block any mm -hmm. success that perhaps could be coming and I'm just blocking it, then that to me is success. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you have as your sort of weekly, you know, grounding anchor that if you just do this um, I think uh, probably from the coaching work that we've done, it's uh, journaling has really helped me. So for me, just taking, and I'm not as good at this as I should be, um, taking time to just reflect and not just think things through in your mind, but actually write some things down and then come back to it. So for me, it's coming back to reflecting on the week that's been and yeah. seeing where the frustrations have occurred and not only looking at how you can do those things better going forward, but yeah. also... Um, where I may have been at fault and maybe I can learn from that or who else I need to bring into the environment to succeed in some of those areas. So I think reflection on a weekly basis is important and as I say, I'd like to um, sound like little Miss Perfect and I do that every <laughs> Friday. Pretty, I sit down pretty. and think that through, but um, um, if, I, if I was um, diligent enough, then that's what I would, would say would probably be a, a good thing to do rather than what tends to happen and I think happens for most productive leaders is you just get caught up in the week yeah. and you just roll over into the next week and then you almost reach a, reach a breaking point or something's gone disastrously wrong, whereas if you'd been able to step back and look at it, you probably could have put it back on yeah. course. That's really good advice. I think morale is the other thing that, you know, when I, I think about your team, and we've done quite a few team trainings, the morale in your team mm -hmm. seems incredibly high. Mm -hmm. is, is that a leadership thing, do you think, or is that something because of the people that are within your team? Are you the cause of their high morale? No, I think it's a combination of the two, yeah. and it goes back to how you recruit people and that intuition around knowing bringing people on the ride that you know that want to be there um, and also continually helping them to grow. So I think it, it's appreciating what they can offer to you, as I said earlier, uh, and myself growing from how they can challenge me and that's where it's important to bring people on the team that do think in a different way. We're a very small team so there is that need to have each other's back and, mm -hmm. and make sure that we're focused on the end goal. So I think it's just that you need a strong leader who can have their backs and keep people informed, but you also need to be available to mentor and support and actually not let things fester, but address things. And so regular meetings are, are critical. Oh, good. And when you think about what it is you're trying to achieve, describe to us <laughs> what it is, this huge project that you're in charge of, what are you, what are you trying to achieve? So the, the Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct is, is obviously trying to become a, a really strong integrated community that really enables um, collaboration to drive innovation. So it's about bringing people from a range of disciplines into an environment where they can 
come together in, in formats, whether it's formally or informally, whether it's the coffee shop or it's an organised event, and actually learn to share their discipline areas because the way of the future and all technologies going forward is just going to be about that collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the vision of the precinct to really drive the jobs of the future, to provide the pipeline of skills, both from the university sector through to the clinical environment, is really got to be based around what are we good at. So for me, it's about creating a world-class precinct that isn't just a saying, it's actually what it is because it's based on the true um, research, academic and clinical strengths of the precinct partners that we have here at Griffith University and also Gold Coast Health with the support of the city of Gold Coast in terms of its aims around diversifying the economy and create this 200 hectares to really drive productivity of, of that job growth and economic sustainability. So how many jobs do you reckon? In total, from the work you're doing, how many oh. jobs will be created? Do so you believe? We have around um, 11,000 jobs currently already in the precinct and we would hope once we've fully built out the available nine hectares of land with the right users that we'll create up to 26,000 jobs. But those just won't be um, any jobs, they'll be those knowledge-based jobs that we, you also can't underestimating, underestimate the indirect effects. So by creating really strong, high-skilled jobs, you create a whole streamline of support jobs in a range of sectors which will filter across the whole city. So the, the precinct, once fully built out, will provide about 11% of the jobs on the Gold Coast. That's um, incredible. So if we, if we get it right and we've got the opportunity when, to do that. Yes, when we get it right. When we get it right. <laughs> Um, it's, it, it could be an amazing example and the world is taking notice because it's quite unique in having all of those partners on the journey and having such a close geographic location of these areas of um, amazing knowledge and skill. Look, as the world's starting to learn the name Di Dixon, <laughs> come on, how does that feel? As, as you see your name in the paper and, and people are talking about you and you go to networking events, honestly, you walk into an event, are you overwhelmed? Are you excited? Are you humbled? How do you feel? I, well, I'm completely humble, but, and I know that I've been on this journey, particularly on the Gold Coast, and my, my credibility now is based on the support I've had along the way. I've had amazing managers, leaders, mentors on that journey, and I have a very strong network that I can pick up the phone to and have conversations yeah. around things. So for me, it's a humbling experience yeah. to be given this opportunity to lead on such an amazing project, but it would only exist without all those people that have been around me on that whole journey. Yeah. That's great. And so if they're, let's say for example someone's listening to this and they know they want support and they want to collaborate but they're a bit hesitant. They think, well I'm not going to create 26,000 jobs or I'm not this or I'm. What advice would you give them? Because when we first mm -hmm. met, you were employed with economic development and referred me to your manager, mm -hmm. right? So it was a first step. Yep. It's been a huge journey you've taken. What would, you, what would your one piece of advice be to somebody that's thinking, I want to reach out but I don't really know if it would fit for me, this coaching thing? I think in terms of the, the coaching, it's about just having faith in yourself. If, you, if you've got it in your mind, you want to go on a journey, you want to grow yourself in your career and your position and your life in general and feel good about all of that, then you need someone on the outside who can reflect for you. So. I, th I found the coaching is almost that mirror opportunity for, for, for you to articulate where your life's heading and some of the roadblocks, but some of the challenges, but also some of the successes and how you can use all of that to keep moving forward. And for me, the one-on-one -on -one coaching and the team coaching that, w that we've undertaken as well has really just kept everyone on the journey, kept the vision very clear, which has just then facilitated cooperation, respect and trust, which, as you said earlier, a leader isn't a leader without the whole team behind them and people to lead, so yeah. it's a collaboration. That's great. So if there was uh, one way that you could sum up success for you, this next part of the journey, oh. if you had to think <laughs> of, uh, what, what would it be for you? What success? So I think, I think short, shorter term success would be seeing a couple of construction projects happening mm -hmm. over the road in the uh, land that's available. Um, and those being very clearly linked to the end user focus that we've had for four years. So the, the, the two potential buildings that would hopefully start construction by the end of this year or early next year have been fully based around identifying those core strengths that the partners have, targeting global investors or companies that would have value to co-locate or be involved in a strategic partnership, and driving that forward, which is now potentially um, gonna result in 
physical infrastructure that the coast will then have for the long term and actually then be able to attract further industry, commercial and research investment. Wow, so if that's you, you need to contact I. <laughs> but also it's amazing to think that when you drive past this is a legacy mm -hmm. that you're going to leave for the work that you're doing. Um, I think in terms of success, sometimes it can be external and sometimes it can be internal. Is there any internal drivers to success for you? Respect or love or... Um... I think for me the biggest reward I always get is just from seeing outcomes. I'm very outcome yes. focused. I've been very clear in my mind what I've been trying to achieve. So when you ask about short term success, it's going to be being able to physically see, see a building coming yeah. out of the ground and someone investing multi-million dollars worth of funding to make that happen and they base that on the articulation of the value of them being here. So right. it's, yeah. You're All clear. That. You're clear. Well, I have no doubt in my <laughs> mind. My faith is 100% on your team. And I wish you all the best. Thank and you thank so you for much. the time that you've no, taken. Thank you. Appreciate it. No. Thanks, Di. Thank you.